Great, everyone. Welcome. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Why don't we begin yep. with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. Heavenly Father, open our minds and our hearts to your word. Help us more deeply understand your Eucharist, the second of the three sacraments of initiation. This act of thanksgiving, this invitation of making yourself present in a very real and tangible way so that we have the means to become what we consume. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Does anybody have any questions for me from last week? No. All good? Okay. Any questions from the gallery? <laughs> okay. So you can watch the lecture. It's posted. So what you missed, if you go to that website, you know how to do that? Have you been there? You can watch the lecture. So you haven't missed anything. Just try and watch it. Okay. And we used some videos from forum.org. And I think that worked out pretty well, actually. Um, and so you can't get to that uh, from the, like, if you go to my YouTube channel, it won't show up. But if you go through the whyamiapriest.com and click on that link, because it's a private link. Since I didn't want to, I wanted to limit copyright because we do pay for it and it's legal, I think, everything. But I just wanted to make sure that it was the people in the RCA who had their way. Okay, great. All right. So it may seem funny that we're talking about the Eucharist. And here I am, you know, talk, having this presentation on the Ark of the Covenant. But you've heard me say this probably many times that the Catholic Church is technically not a Christian denomination. It is the Christian church. It technically, technically is a Jewish denomination, okay? And so at the heart of the Hebrew people's worship was uh, the temple. You know, they have the beautiful Exodus event. They get delivered from Egypt. They're instructed to build an ark. They carry this ark with them for battles and all the rest. It becomes a, 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 a artifact of history. Movies made about it, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, all that kind of stuff. Um, not that you can go by the historical details of Indiana Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it, it points to, it was actually a relatively accurate portrayal of what they think the Ark looks like. And how do we know? Because the Bible tells us. And so, in fact, here we go. I made a little scale model of the Ark of the Covenant here. Right there and then <laughs> and actually it has uh it's it's made in biblical proportion so i did actually do this and inside the ark of the covenant okay you know what was inside the ark of the covenant we have three things we have the ten commandments okay and also the staff of aaron little staff there i'm not sure how well you can see that and then we have the cup of manna that was kept in the ark of the covenant so we have this beautiful little Ark of the Covenant. And before, and, and when they built the temple, the reason why they built the temple was to hold the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. So, and they believed that God's presence dwelt like amidst or above the Ark of the Covenant. And so, um, and be, yeah, so we'll just run through the presentation because I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Okay. So, there we go. So there's a nice portrayal picture that looks a lot fancier than my little uh, homemade arc. Uh, but you can see it's about the same size proportionally, looks about the same size and that's kind of interesting. Okay, so the contents of the ark, the covenant made with God and his people, the 10 commandments, staff of Aaron, the manna and the bread from heaven. Okay, in Exodus, it says in Exodus 25, you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark and we have to move our pictures because we're, uh, there we go. And in the ark, you shall put the covenant that I shall give you. There I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the covenant, I will deliver to you all my commands for the Israelites. So we see that in, our, in Exodus chapter 25. Okay. I need to touch this because I touched the thing. So there now, we're, oops. 
Okay. Oh, I skipped that slide. Apparently it jumped. The bread from... Uh-oh. Sorry. Trying to figure out where I'm at here. There it is. Okay. All right. There we go. So Exodus 25. Now, the significance of the covenant. God's covenant is not so much about commands as it is about a relationship. God did not say, you do this, 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 and this, or you will go to hell. You can't find that in the Bible. What you can find in the Bible is you do this, 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 and this, and I will be your God and you will be my people. God longs for us to be in relationship with him. The covenant is understood to be the tablets that the Israelites received at the hand of God through Moses. Okay, New Numbers chapter 17. And the Lord said to Moses, put back the staff of Aaron before the covenant to be kept as a warning to rebels so that you may make an end of their complaints against me or else they will die. Um, clearly there was a lot of fear uh, and God manifested his great power. I mean, the ark one day, there's, there's a place where the ark was going to fall and somebody reached out to touch the ark. They weren't supposed to do that. Uh, and they died. And you're saying, God. He was trying to stop the ark from falling. Well, it was showing that God could have stopped it. So it's this radical trust in God. And so in the Old Testament, in many respects, God is a distant God. But in the New Testament, he's an intimately close God, that he became one of us. You know, God became infinitely close to us so that we could become close to God. Really is a beautiful thing, okay? Not just any staff. This was supposedly the staff that consumed the staff of the Pharaoh's magicians. This was the staff that was held over the Red Sea as the Israelites were ultimately delivered from Pharaoh's grasp. This is the staff that was used to, um, um, for Moses and Aaron to shepherd them to the promised land. Okay, so looks like a typographical error in that, that slide there. I need to fix that. Okay, so the manna, Exodus 16, And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. So again, we have this manna that they kept. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. Then in Exodus 16, the Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to the habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is a tenth of an ephah. That tells you a lot, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. So I need to figure that out. How much is an ephah now? Do I have it down to the next slide? I'm not sure. Okay, this is the bread that came down from heaven to sustain the people in the desert. While it sustained them in the desert, it did not give them eternal life. Now, I don't know if you're a big uh, Hobbit fan or Lord of the Rings fan, but the uh, clearly the bread that they gave, I, I can't even remember what they called that stuff. There was like bread, like magical bread. If they ate just this bread, they could get all kinds of strength. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but it was this bread that was just life-giving to, to them. And so it's, uh, it's my old Dungeon and Dragons days, actually. Uh, it's the same kind of thing, you know? So I never did that for very long, but Dungeons and Dragons comes right out of The Hobbit. That's where all that stuff comes from. I didn't know. I didn't yeah. watch movie. Never saw the, oh, you, you, you should watch The Lord of the Rings. I, I have, they're good. The book is better, the book is better. But no, it's so it's very Catholic in many respects. It's very, very the guy JJ J.R.R. Tolkien is very Catholic. Yeah, he he was friends, he was friends with uh, um, um, uh, um, he wrote screw tape letters. Uh, I think it was Chesterton and oh, uh, what's his name? C.S. Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. C can you believe that? Believe that. C.S. Lewis. I'm getting older. Maybe I'm just going mad. I don't know. But yeah, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, they would sit there in the, they had like a pub that they would gather and talk and feel like do these things. And, and J.R.R. Tolkien would get mad at C.S. Lewis because he would have these fairies and all these different things. And, and they didn't really have any real significance. And J.R.R. Tolkien, he's, you just can't throw a fairy in there. You have to have a reason for it. And he said, no, no, you know, so but anyway, sorry, I'm getting way distracted there, sorry. But the, it is, Lord of the Rings, it's, it's, it's the perennial battle between good and evil. But all that 
in the Lord of the Rings, they have this manna. They don't call it manna, but they have this bread that's supernaturally strong and giving life. So that's kind of, it's an allusion to the Eucharist, our life-giving bread. So not, not to distract, but did that, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings, did it take place uh, at what like, time period in conjunction? It's totally mythical. So oh, oh. it's it's Middle Earth. So it's, it's like a, it's like Star Wars. Oh. It's not it's historical in any, in any kind of way, it's it's just a, well, a mythical. Meant after, yeah, like, I mean, just put it in a perspective. Yeah, like yeah, it's it's just a it's just a total fantasy story. It's not rooted in any kind of historical thing. They have the age of men. They have the age of elves. You know, the ages of you know this this perennial thing, and then hobbits and hobbits inhabit Middle Earth. So it's it's just it's really just a fantasy. It's not connected in history in any way. The tent, Moses would enter the tent and find himself in God's presence. This is before they built the temple. He would have to cover his face because he would be radiant with light around his head when he'd come out. St. Jerome mistranslated the original um, that talked of rays of light as he came out from, and he said they were horns of light in the Vulgate. That's what led Michelangelo to sculpt Moses with horns. So if you see this, I don't know if you see his Moses horns, but if you go to Notre Dame, right outside the library, they have a big statue of Moses that's that's an image of this, and he's got horns on it. So, and the reason why is because it said rays of light, but when Jerome translated the Greek into the Latin, he called it horns of light. <laughs> so, you know, the, the evangelicals or whatever think we're trying to make Moses out to be a devil, I guess, I'm not sure, but it's not that. It's, it's rays of light, horns of light is what Michelangelo literally put on his head. So uh, seeing God, a great fear of the Israelites stemmed from a belief that one would die if they saw God. Moses was believed to be truly a friend of God. And, you know, um, I think this is interesting because the more clearly we see God, I am convinced the more fully we die to ourselves. So our deep, the deeper the relationship with God, the more distant we become, we come, we, we become from sin, you know? So it's like, they're right. When we see God, we die to ourselves, and we just live no longer for ourselves but for God and others. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I think, um, the Latin word for tent is tabernacle. When the Israelites would find stability, they would ultimately build a temple inside the temple and its central, its central feature was the Holy of Holies. Behind the veil was kept the ark and the very mercy seat of God. And again, Josephus, this is interesting. First century Jewish historian Josephus recounts that smoke from the temple, the sacrifices were constant. And regardless of wind direction, the smoke would ascend vertically at all times. So if it was super windy, the smoke would still go straight up above the temple. You know, and so God manifested his great power and in showing the people the miracle of all this. And, and they sacrificed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They were always sacrificing. There was no end. So it was burning all the time. In the Holy of Holies was kept the ark, the ark's contents, again, the tablets of the law, the staff of Aaron and the cup of manna. The last mention of the ark, this is found in Jeremiah 314. Return, O faithless children, says the Lord, for I am your master, I will take you one from the city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, says the Lord, they shall no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed, nor shall another one be made. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather to it to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they shall no longer stubbornly follow their own evil will. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel, and together they shall come from the land of the north to the land that I gave your ancestors for a heritage. I thought how I would set you among my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful heritage of the nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. When Jeremiah arrived there, he found a room in a cave in which he put the tent, the ark, and the altar of incense. Then he blocked up the entrance 
Some of those who followed him came up intending to mark the path, but they could not find it. When Jeremiah heard of this, he reproved them. The place is to remain unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows them mercy. So I guess that's Maccabees is where it says what happened to the ark. But that, that previous light in Jeremiah is this beautiful prophecy of what God was preparing. You see how God was saying, my people, we won't need the ark in a sense, not the same ark that they had, but we will be that living presence of God. People will recognize us. We will have the law written in our hearts, you know? So, so where is the ark now? They don't know. Oh, it's still. still well, I, I get to this. There's some people that claim they have it. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Where did that go? It didn't, it didn't, I don't, I don't have it in there. In Ethiopia, there is a uh, monastery that they do believe, and they say that they do have the Ark of the Covenant, but they really won't let anybody in to see it. So, um, yeah. So, um, so all that background, and here we're talking about the Eucharist, okay? The Eucharist is the Mass. The Eucharist is um, what we celebrate, the Eucharist, yeah. And the Eucharist is the, um, the host. And so it's a, it's a big word. The, the word Eucharist, literally from the Greek, it means thanksgiving. So that when we come to mass, we are invited to consume the body of Christ. And so if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, right? That tent was called tabernacle. And what do we call the little box at mass? Tabernacle, right? What's in our tabernacle? Jesus. Not a symbol. It's really, really Jesus. We believe that it's Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Okay. And it didn't go over well when Jesus said this. In John chapter six, he said, your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. I am the living bread come down from heaven. For my body is real food, my blood is real drink. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. In fact, he uses the Greek word trogon, which means to munch, gnaw, devour. In the Old Testament, when, when like Isaiah, I think it was, who consumed and devoured the scroll, tasted sweet in his mouth, but when he had to come out and say the hard things that God wanted the people to hear, it wasn't tasty so well. You know, it's, it's not easy to tell people difficult things, okay? The gospel is not welcomed in our world today, okay? So, um, so, so what's interesting about this is that Jesus Christ is in that tabernacle and Jesus in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word of God, like the 10 commandments. Jesus is the good shepherd. And what does every good shepherd need? He needs a staff. And Jesus said, your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. I am the living bread come down from heaven. He is that manna in a sense. He is our bread. And what's interesting, I'm told that among the Jewish literature, that when the Messiah would come, they believed the manna would return. And isn't that cool? Because Christ came and in a sense, the manna did return in the Eucharist. And somewhere, someday, every second of every day, all right, the mass is being offered. In the book of Malachi, I think it's chapter one, verse 11, it says, my people will offer me a pure offering from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure offering will be made. Well, Jesus Christ is that only pure offering. Only in Jesus is that pure offering made. Jesus is the pure offering, nothing's nothing pure. And we make present Jesus Christ at the Eucharist, at the mass. This is my favorite line. I love this line, you've heard me say it before, but at mass, we rip across the fabric of space and time and are thrust into the mystical presence of God's death and resurrection in the cross and the resurrection. It's really cool stuff. And the Greek word that they use for this is anamnesis. So when Jesus says, do this in, sometimes it's translated remembrance of me, or do this in memory of me, the Greek word is anamnesis. And that anamnesis is the translation of the Hebrew word zikaron. And the Jewish people, when they celebrate the Seder meal, when they celebrate the Passover meal, it's not just a calling to mind, but they believe that some way they are participating, they're thrust into the presence of that Exodus event. So in a Seder meal, it begins with the youngest child 
who said, who the ch youngest child that's able says, what's different about this night? So I don't know if you've ever recall that movie, Mel Gibson's The Passion. Mary, one of the Marys at the beginning says, what is different about this night? And then the oldest among them proceeds to tell the story. This is the night when the people of Israel were delivered from their slavery. And it goes through that dialogue. And when they set the table, there's always a, a place setting for Elijah. And so when the little children aren't watching, the older person drinks the wine glass. It's kind of like cookies in Santa Claus, you know? But so they're always in this constant expectation of the coming of Jesus Christ, okay? So it's just a, a great thing, beautiful thing. And so that's why the Eucharist is that Passover that extends through all the ages, through all time, until the end of time, until we meet that heavenly banquet where we will be together again with God and his angels and all his saints, okay? So it's, it's just this, this incredible richness. Um, and again, going back to John 6, it didn't go over well. When Jesus said this, he said, look, I'm giving you my flesh to eat. My body is real food. My blood is real drink. You must eat my flesh. You must munch my flesh. You must devour my flesh and blood. And the people say, this guy's nuts. He's crazy. This, this is crazy. And most of his disciples no longer accompanied him. They left. If Jesus meant it metaphorically or symbolically, don't you think he said, come on, guys, I meant this metaphorically. He didn't say that. In fact, he pushes it. He goes to his disciple. He goes to the 12 and he says, OK, guys, do you want to leave me too?" And Peter, you got to love Peter. Where else can we go? We believe and are convinced that you are the Christ, the son of God. And it's faith. I can recall talking to a DRE many, many years ago, not in this parish, in another parish. And she was explaining to me how she was teaching the children about First Communion. And she said, um, we do this to remember Jesus. And I said, no, <laughs> we don't do this to remember Jesus. We do this to consume Jesus. We eat Jesus. And she was like scandalized. She said, Can they can't understand that. I just simply said, can you? I can't understand it either. But that's what the scriptures say. That's at the core of the Catholic faith. Our understanding of the real presence of the Eucharist, that is the very core and central tenet of our faith. That's what separates us from many, many Christian denominations. The Anglicans typically have a very high view of the Eucharist, depending on some high Anglicans would see the real presence. I think they would even believe in transubstantiation. Um, Lutherans believe in a real presence, but it's a presence that's along with Lutherans. I think Luther opted for a consubstantiation, which means with the substance of God. So they understand that Jesus is really present with the bread, the elements of bread and wine. We believe the elements of bread and wine only look like bread and only taste like bread and only taste like wine. And it can make you drunk if you drink too much consecrated wine. It'll have all the accidental effects of alcohol. But we believe that it's substantially transformed to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And it's not the host is a body and the, the wine is the blood. No, the wine and the bread, after they're consecrated, are fully Christ. Even if you have a drop of the precious blood, you're getting the full Christ. You're not just getting his blood. If you get one small fragment, you get the body and blood of Christ, whether you take the host or the chalice. It's the body and blood of Christ in its fullness. Symbolically, it's either easier for our heads to get around like the precious blood and, and the host. But, And this is another cool thing about the host. We call the host, right? When we receive it, we call it the host. Now, this is probably unfair for me to say this, okay? And I don't want it to be taken the wrong way because we all like to be hosts, right? I mean, we host a party, right? But what does the host do? They provide everything you need for the party, right? The place, the food, you know, all that stuff. Now, in the animal kingdom, what do you call that, that the parasite you know, that's like, I think of those little fish that like clamp onto sharks. 
They call them parasites. So what, what is the shark called? You know, those things that like attach to the side of the shark and suck their blood out. The shark is the host. The shark is the host. So in other words, the host has a bunch of leeches around them. <laughs> okay, I mean, they, they suck everything from the host, right? You're, and you're giving a party, you're, you know, you're providing everything, they're taking all this stuff, okay? God is the host. He gives himself for us so we can take everything from him. And this is something I just recently learned in all the Eucharistic miracles, it seems as though they can determine the blood type, like on the shroud, I guess on the face cloth of Veronica, they can get a blood type from that. The Eucharistic miracles, they could get the blood type. And the blood type is AB. Did you know that? Jesus' blood type is AB. And you know what's unique about AB blood? Huh? You can use it for everything. No, you can't use it for everything. It, it, O is the universal donor. But if you have the AB uh, blood type, you can take any blood. It's the universal receptor. So if you're sick and you have AB, AB blood, you can take A blood, you can take B blood, you can take O blood. In other words, if you have the AB blood type, it's the universal receptor. Isn't that cool? How God arranges the world to always show his generosity that he receives all who come to him. Isn't that beautiful? And he's given us these miracles to reveal this dimension of his being. That's just so cool, I think. I get excited about little different things. I don't know. Uh, I just have a question. Bob's got a question. When, when the priest has, you know, after the host is consecrated, before he consumes it, he breaks it in a special way and he takes one little piece, puts it in the chalice. Bob is asking about when the priest breaks the host at the Lamb of God, right? The yeah. Lamb of God. Yeah. You know, my body is broken for you. Not bones, but his body is broken for you. He breaks the host, and then he breaks off a little tiny piece of the host and drops it in the wine. And the priest says, may the mingling of the body and blood of Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. And so the idea is that it's just that mingling of the body and blood of Christ. Maybe mingling the body and blood of Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Okay, okay. so I mean, that's... It's a symbol, it's a sign. Okay, okay. And, and that's the breaking, the breaking of the bed is the breaking of... It's so the Lamb of God. We do it at the Lamb of God. Yeah. Lamb of God yeah. who takes away the sins of the world, yeah. have mercy on us. And then I noticed... Uh, so the Lamb is sacrificed for us. Okay. Yeah. And then I noticed some priests like... Uh, like... You know, like condense it, and so you've got like two different like halves right. of yeah. the host. And it, it, yeah. There's no, there's no, no, like, there's you're not taught seminary how to. I don't think so. No, I just always try and put it so it looks like a whole host. But here's the thing what about the Passover event? Okay, you had the lamb, but what did you have to do with the lamb? Had to eat it. Yeah, you yeah. ate the lamb. And so God foreshadows this incredible reality. And what, what was the first thing? Do you remember when, when John the Baptist sees Jesus in a distance? Do you remember how he announces Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who is given up for us. It's so beautiful. And the Eucharist just helps us to relive that reality every day of our life. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't Bethlehem, doesn't that mean house of bread? Uh, Bethlehem means house of bread. That's right. Yeah. And, yep. and even at early, uh, Jesus's earliest uh, time on earth, I mean, he was bread for us even at that. Well, I mean, the mass was, the first mass was the last supper. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if a Catholic knows their faith, they're not going to leave the church. The reason why most people leave the church is because it's hard. You know, um, world is broken. Their marriage, divorce. Well, these other Christians say I can get divorced and remarried. And it's no problem for them. And 
And God's going to sort all that out. God is a merciful God. God is a loving God. God is great all the time. Um, but the church is constrained to be faithful. The 19th chapter of Matthew is very clear. Jesus said, God made them male and female. What God has joined, men must not divide unless the marriage is unlawful. So a lot of people leave the church, not because they know her teaching, but they've been scandalized by her members. You know, sometimes priests can hurt people very deeply. And so uh, we just try and make present all that is good, true, and beautiful, you know? Any questions? Yes, learn? I have a question. Great, Melinda. The hose line, it doesn't matter which one you take because each one has the body and blood. Why does the priest have to take each one? Um, well, I mean, the priest does it because that's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. And Jesus and the priest is is in the person of Christ. So it's just an imitation of Jesus, I think. Because that's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. This was a big battle in the church. Plus, and don't you break the host because Jesus was broke? Well, I mean, some priests will hold it up and it'll look like a fish. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, you know, the Lamb of God was sacrificed for us. So the breaking of the host is symbolic of the sacrificial uh, suffering that Jesus did at the Lamb of God. That Lamb was given up for us, He was sacrificed for us. And so it's a symbol of that breaking of the lamb, breaking of the bread. But they didn't break any of those bones. So it's not like it's not like right. Jesus were taking a bite, bite out of his arm. We're not, it's not that. Right. Okay. It is the real presence of Jesus. It's the substantial presence of Jesus. But we don't want to think of it as like, I, I love this little story. I almost use it at every Christmas homily. This little girl, uh, I, I was not a priest yet, I don't think. I might have been a deacon. And I was, it was in Boston or in Bradford, Massachusetts, I think in the classroom in the school there. And she puts up her hand and she says, if Christmas is Jesus' birthday, why do we get presents? You know, pretty good question. And, you know, it, I think it's important to try and answer questions and God's been pretty good to me. So I can think on the fly and the Holy Spirit came through with me on this. Okay. I said, you know, Jesus said, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do unto me. And so in a way, when you're giving somebody a gift, in a way, you're giving it to the body of Christ. When you get a present, it's Jesus who receives it because we're all part of his body. She got a big smile on her face and then a really quizzical look and said, if Jesus is about your size, how do we all fit in his body? <laughs> and it's the Eucharist. <laughs> That's how we do it. Because I told her that I said, you know, you eat a cheeseburger, right? And when you eat a cheeseburger, that stuff goes, becomes part of you, makes you grow strong and big. Well, when we take Christ, and this is what's so key about transubstantiation, we are substantially consuming Christ. We are metabolizing Christ. We are becoming what we consume. We are called to become more and more Christ-like by our opportunity to consume really Jesus. Not just something that touches our spirit, but it touches our flesh as well. I mean, Jesus is substantially present. So it's not just something that, it, and it's that way in which we are transformed into his mystical body to go forth and proclaim the good news to everyone. My, my book had the same prayer. Busha, that's your grandmother, right? Yeah, she would not. She told us it was a sin to chew. The, the, what you receive from me, you're supposed to like, just let it come um, up. Like, no. Again, you know, yeah, so some people say, but actually, literally, the Greek says you must munch, gnaw, and chew. So, so, right, so the idea, it's, it's a pious practice. I can remember the old Monsignor telling me, um, you know, like, there's, it's a certain form of reverence to try not to chew it, right? And, and he said, but if it touches your teeth, don't worry about it. It's not like a sin or nothing, you know, so he didn't want the little boy becoming scrupulous or anything. Um, but so it, it's just, you know, so it's just a, a reverence, you know, it's a, a reverence that, and that's where that comes from. It's a, it's a sense of reverence that we can show, um, to Jesus by being very reverent, even in the way we consume him. Yeah. So. My, 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 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Bible says. Father Glenn, would you say the definition of the Eucharist again? Because sometimes I'm under the impression that they're referring to the body of Christ. But yep. it's not. The Eucharist, the host can be called the Eucharist. The host is the Eucharist. It, it's a very and the mass can be called the Eucharist. A mass can be called the Eucharist. Yep. Okay. It, it's it's a very broad word. So the Holy Eucharist is the host. The Holy Eucharist is the mass. You know, it's what we're trying to do, if you think about it. You're trying to describe something that is totally outside of our experience. I mean, God is not something that you can limit or define. And so that's why the Eucharist is so expansive. Literally from the Greek, it just means Thanksgiving. Eucharistia, the Greek word means Thanksgiving. Yep. And then back in the beginning of this presentation, what is the mercy seat? It, it's just the, like where the angels are sitting, like above it. You know, so God, the mercy seat is like above the ark, is my understanding. It's like the top of it then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is that, that it's, it's God's dwells there. And, and what is the seat of mercy but God? He always shows mercy. He was showing, like in today's reading at Mass, which was the, the story between Cain and Abel, God was showing great mercy to Cain, but Cain rejected it. He didn't want, he didn't want it, so... I will I will ask Google how much an F is. It's one well, we know the whole <laughs> Hey Siri, what is the measurement? <laughs> yeah. They said alpha. They didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. I have to do it on yeah, Google here. Good. Have to. Oh. Much is an F. Okay, an, an ancient Hebrew unit of dry measure equal to a tenth of a homer or about one bushel. Okay, so. So from one third bushel to a little over one bushel. So it's not real clear. It, um, in ancient Hebrew, a dry unit volume measure equal to a bath or one tenth of an omer is approximately equal to 22 liters. So an omer is big. Yeah. Wow. So 220 liters would be an omer. So, okay, great. Thanks. So about a bushel. An F is a lot. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Any other questions? One last question. <laughs> Back at the beginning of this presentation, Aaron said, is the magicians? I'm gonna have to repeat that or send a text because my internet connection was a little sketchy there. What was it? What did Aaron's staff do to the magicians? Oh, when Aaron threw his staff down, it turned into a snake. And then that snake took the other two snakes, and then it became his staff again. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, from the movie. It's in the Bible. Yeah. Right. Oh, my God. His staff. Yeah, and then they, they, we can make our snakes and their staffs yeah. into snakes, and he did it. And then Moses' staff ate the other two snakes. Yeah. And Moses, Moses never got to the, the, right, the promised land, right. So Aaron was the one who... Uh, Joshua, actually. Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Joshua was the son of Aaron. I believe that's right, yeah. Very good. Everything good? Good. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And with your spirit. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Now, be careful getting home. Right? That's why I'm doing Zoom. There's three people here. Good night, everybody. Yeah, good night. <laughs>